And today's message is on prayers, power, promise, and purpose. What is the power of prayer? What is God's promise to us? We've got all kinds of different agendas we may bring to God in prayer, but what is God's promise to us in prayer? And what's the purpose of prayer and of our being Christian in the first place? So we're going to be looking at that today as we turn to God's Word. Last week we focused in particular on Luke 11 verses 9 and 10. Today we'll pick up verses 9 and 10 again and read on through verse 13. I invite you to hear now God's word. I'm also going to be turning to some other passages from the author Luke in Luke's gospel and then in Acts. Luke chapter 11 verses 9 through 13. Jesus is speaking and I say to you or literally to you I say that's the order he gives there. Ask and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. For everyone asking receives, and the one seeking finds, and to the one knocking it shall be opened. But what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? So, if you, who are evil, no good gifts to give your children, how much more the Father who is in heaven will give the Holy Spirit to those asking him? And then following the resurrection, as Jesus is teaching his disciples in the 40 days uh, following his resurrection, Luke gives us this high point from Jesus' discussion about his fulfillment of the scriptures as he speaks with and teaches his disciples. This is Luke 24, verse 49. Jesus says, And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. wonder what that promise would be. But stay in the city until you are, well, there's kind of a parallel there. There's going to be an answer here. Clothed with power from on high. So the promise is apparently power from God that's going to clothe Christians, Jesus' disciples, the church. Then we move on to Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. While, and while staying with them, he, Jesus, ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait, there's this term again, for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And then Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. So I periodically hear people talking about the power of prayer. I believe in the power of prayer. I'll hear televangelists say, I'll hear all kinds of various stripes of Christians say, the power of prayer? What is the power of prayer? Well, let's get this straight so that we don't go off the rails with a bunch of televangelists and other people here. I want you to be biblically led and informed Christians. The power of prayer is not about our power over God via incantation. Contrary to a lot of name it, claim it, uh, common folks that you may meet on the street or at the golf club or wherever, or that you may hear from televangelists uh, who have big, big ministries, we don't gin up a genie God in the name of Jesus. That is not what prayer is about. We are not ginning up a genie God. The genie and his bottle, y'all like him? That, that's not the message. This is the opposite of what, just, just think about that. 
That is a joke. That's a joke. A lot of so-called Christians talk that way, though. We don't gin up a genie God and give orders to him about what he needs to snap to and do for us as long as we slap the abracadabra name Jesus at the end of our uh, ginned up genie orders. Uh, by the way, yesterday I was listening to a report on problems with Disneyland, and they played that old song, you know, from Pinocchio, uh, Jiminy Cricket. When you wish upon a star. And, and, you know, the basic idea is as long as you wish really hard and, uh, you know, your, uh, your nose is going to grow and you may get in trouble, but you will get what you want, right? No, uh, not, not quite. So nix the name it, claim it, false teaching and sermons, please. God is the author of prayer's power. Not my flesh, not my desires, God. He is the giver of power and the answer in himself. And he is the guide and goal of prayer in Christ's name. So we've been saying that throughout this series on prayer as we've looked at Luke chapter 11, the first half of Luke chapter 11, so I want you to stay with that. That's a summary of where we've been and a reminder of where we are today. And let me remind you of this too, as we've been saying, so-called faith, I'm a person of faith. Okay, let me see your prayer life. Faith and families devoid of prayer fall into godliness really fast. Marriages devoid of prayer. I'm talking about husbands and wives that do not pray together, get off the rails and fall into godlessness really fast. Parents and children who are not people steeped in prayer. Households that are not steeped in prayer. Churches that are not steeped in prayer. You and me, if we are not in prayer, and Jesus indicates, it's not a suggestion, he calls us to daily and regular continual prayer. If you're telling me you're above Jesus' level, we got a big conversation we need to have. If you are not a person, if you are not a family of prayer, if your so-called faith is not steeped in prayer, you are going heading into godliness really fast. Prayer, in turn, though, that is not Godward, the prophets of Baal prayed a lot. Pagan priestesses and cult prostitutes prayed a lot in those days. We're talking about prayer in the direction of the living, the one God. Prayer that is not Godward is no good at all either. So what we get down to is um, you know, there's this old debate in Christian theology, Lex Arande. Lex credendi, you know, does the faith come first? Does the prayer come first? And in the Reformed tradition, we pretty much say your prayer better be guided by strong biblical faith. Okay? And, and so I've got this kind of in that direction laid out for you. False faith leads to false prayers. Leads to foolishness, frustration, fruitlessness, and falling away from faith. If you get guaranteed by a bunch of folks well, if you just pray this and say the right abracadabra and, you know, drill down hard enough on it, it's going to happen for you exactly the way you tell God you want it to happen, exactly the way you order the genie, you're going to fall away. What I'm inviting you to, what the Bible, what Jesus is ultimately inviting you to, is a living relationship with the one living God. And he is the power of prayer, the power in prayer, and he is the one who guides our prayer. So let's remember, based on prayer that is guided by gospel, biblical gospel faith, Jesus is called to salvation and discipleship. First of all, Jesus and the rest in the New Testament, prophesied in the Old Testament, says this, repent, number one, repent, turn, from all else to God alone. Olivia in the children's time, I loved it when you said, we only worship God, God alone. Yep, that's it. Turn from all else to God alone and believe the gospel, which is saving power. The gospel is saving power. Secondly, receive 
the Father's promise. <clears throat> now, I got to tell you, a lot of Protestants and a lot of Reformed Christians get number one right, but they stop at number one. This is a problem, folks. Uh, this is a serious problem because you're not going to have a living relationship with the Lord Jesus. And in fact, the justifying work of Jesus cannot be imparted and imbued in you unless you are born again in his spirit. You must be joined with Christ. You must be one with Christ. And that comes by the living power and presence and purpose of the Holy Spirit. So receive the Father's promise. The Gospels are telling us over and over again, this is where this is headed. This is not just about some abstract idea about Jesus dying on the cross. It's a living gospel and a living relationship with the living God as you are transformed from the inside out by his spirit in you. Receive the Father's promise, number two, his spirit. In general terms, I would call this New Covenant or New Testament sanctification. And if you are justified, you will be sanctified. I can tell you that. If you think, well, I got this justification thing down, but I'm not into sanctification, it's just not going to work. They, they are integrally related. And then number three, rejoice in sure hope as children who glorify and enjoy God in his kingdom now and eternally. This is our predestined purpose. And if you're not Reformed and not Presbyterian and you're freaking out about that terminology, I've, I've got to include it today because it's number three here and it's going to come back to us from the scripture. So, and that's good news. It's good news that God has a plan for us. Amen? You think it's good news God has a plan for us? Don't you want to know somebody out there or up there has a game plan in the midst of all our chaos? Amen? Yeah. So, uh, Here's the call today on prayer, flowing from that basic gospel faith, one, two, three. You gotta have all three of those, all the way to eschatology, in other words, with number three. Through Christ, God calls us to himself as humble yet confident. Always gotta hold those things together now. Humble yet confident children who, number one, here's what you're supposed to be doing in your prayer life, okay? Ask for God and his grace in Christ, desiring nothing else, and to be given his gospel. That's saving power. That's the power of prayer. Number two, flowing from that and the actual imbuing of his power. Number two, seek his kingdom, receive his spirit, and find and live new life in him. That's the New Testament promise. That's the New Testament promise, a transformative kingdom alive in us and making us new people, that we are truly born anew and adopted into the kingdom, truly as his children. Number three, knock and enter. You'll notice I'm using the verbs Jesus uses in 11, 9, and 10 now. Uh, knock and enter through Christ. He is the door. That's what he says to us. You can read that in John chapter 10, verse 7. Knock and enter through Christ his kingdom mission and his eternal house. So circling back around here on number three, belong. I mean, actually belong to God. Actually belong in God's house. If you don't, if you don't know that you belong in God's house, we need to start the whole thing again. We need to go back to number one, okay? Belong, pray, pray. And obey, that's our gospel purpose, and that, that's God's gospel purpose. Now, uh, let's review what we've learned so far. You know, one of Jesus, Jesus is praying yet again in Luke's gospel. Luke is constantly highlighting how Jesus prays. Luke 11, 1. And then at 11, 2 through 4, we have the way to pray. In response to the request, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Okay? Then we get to 11, 2 through 4. Jesus teaches us the way to pray. And he gives us the prayer or the prayer pattern. Luke 11, 5 through 8. This is the parable of the friend at midnight. Dean preached on this a couple of Sundays ago. And now we've circled around a couple of weeks and continue now with Luke 11. Today, all the way through verse 13, 9 through 13. And what this is actually structurally, 
and it's brilliant, from Jesus, and Luke really highlights it. It's a poem. It's in poetic structure. I'm not going to nerd out on you too much on this today. I will refer you to Kenneth Bailey. He wrote pretty extensively on this. My take is slightly different than Bailey's, but we're both in total agreement. Jesus is the ultimate poet of prayer here. And it's just really interesting when you actually dig down into Luke 9 through 13. It's a poem on the power, promise, and purpose of persevering prayer. Let me give you a little bit about Jesus as the poet of prayer. He is the paragon. He's the model of our prayer. That's why we're looking to him. And then he's also showing us yet again he's the poet. Jesus is brilliant in all kinds of dimensions. I mean, he just, if you actually study the Bible, it blows you away how this first century rabbi could create all this stuff, literarily, you know, gospel-wise, theologically. Anyway, uh, 9 through 13, here's the poetic structure. 9 and 10, verses 9 and 10, we have step-up verbs, prayer and answer, okay? Prayer and answer, step-up verbs, and, and they step up, right? Remember this? Ask, seek, knock. There's a definite step-up going on here. We're getting more and more intimate. We're actually coming to the very house of God. Do y'all understand? We're, we're drawing near. That's, that's built into the structure. We talked about that last Sunday. So we have then, with 11 through 13, where we're digging into a little bit more today, we have step up again, smaller to greater. Okay, we're going to go smaller, radically smaller to radically greater contrast of Father's surprising gifts in response to children's asking. And Jesus is going to show us some of his humor in this poem that he gives us because we've got surprisingly horrible gifts, but he's, Jesus is saying rhetorically, obviously, even y'all who are earthly fathers, who are evil, you're fallen in sin, but even you wouldn't give your kid, you know, a snake if he asked for a fish, right? So that's, that's on one side. That's the, that, but then we're going to step up from that, from the smaller to the greater truth here, on this father's surprising gifts to children. We're gonna flip it around and saying, Jesus is saying, look, on the one hand, no way even earthly fathers will give surprisingly deadly, do y'all get this? Dead, this is causes death, snakes and scorpions. He means a poisonous snake here. Surprisingly deadly gifts to their children asking for good things. And now let's flip it around. The father is gonna give surprising gift but this is the gift of life and the spirit of life. It's a shock, just like it would be shocking on the negative side for a dad, even a bad dad on earth, you know, to give a snake in response to a request for a fish. Now the heavenly father, this is amazing, the heavenly father from heaven will give his own spirit, the ultimate perfect gift. This is shocking, amazing grace. The spirit of life bringing regeneration, not something that causes death. Do you follow what Jesus is doing here poetically? But life, eternal life, to his children who are asking. Now, we've just hit a huge surprise in the gospel, in the gospels, because up until now, the Holy Spirit has been mainly about Jesus. We get the Holy Spirit in the Annunciations, respectively, of John, and then step up to the Annunciation of Jesus. Remember, Luke gives us, highlights a lot of step ups, okay? But that's all about, like, special people. The prophet of the Messiah Most High, and then the Messiah Most High himself. And then we have the Holy Spirit not only, you know, bringing about the virgin incarnation of Jesus through, through Mary. The Holy Spirit comes upon the Virgin Mary and brings forth the, the Son of the living God, Jesus. We get the Holy Spirit in Jesus' ministry. Remember what happens when Jesus is praying at his baptism? When he's praying, catch this, he is given the special indwelling of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit comes on him like a dove, right? And then the Spirit compels him into the desert for the temptation. And then we have the Holy Spirit working through Jesus and with Jesus all the time in his ministry. But up until now, there has been no discussion 
in the gospel and in the gospels about the Holy Spirit imbuing and filling his disciples. When Jesus calls people to call, follow him, he says, come follow me. He doesn't say, come follow me, and by the way, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. We've had no discussion about this at all. And now, all of a sudden, almost out of the blue, unless you've read the Old Testament, shock, surprise, amazing grace, Jesus conveys the promise of our being filled with the same spirit that is in him and of him. It's, it's a shock. It's, it's amazing. We better pay attention to this. It's one of the most astounding passages in the entire Bible. Don't gloss over this. Oh, yeah, I know. I'm a Christian, so we talk about the Holy Spirit. This is a big juncture right here. And it's the high point of what Jesus is teaching us about prayer. We are supposed to understand this is the great, surprising, amazing grace climax of this whole section. It's the inclusio circling back around to his mention of the Father at the beginning. Now we've got the Holy Spirit also coming into the conversation. This, though, goes back to, if you were really paying attention in Luke's gospel and in, the, in Matthew and Mark 2, here it is in Luke 3.16. John answered them, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy untie, to untie. And what's the big agenda here? What's the big promise? He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And it, like I said, if you've read the Old Testament, you know this is coming. Through Christ, then, let's talk about what it means to pray as Christians. Through Christ, God calls us to himself as humble yet confident children who ask for God and his grace in Christ, desiring nothing else, and to be given his gospel in response to that ask, saving power. Mark 1, 15, Jesus says, The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. That's what we need to pray in and through and for. Luke 15, 7, Jesus says, Just so I tell you, there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. You need to repent. Martin Luther says, Our daily faith is a faith of constant repentance. That means turning to the Lord. Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you've got to take up your cross daily. Deny yourself daily. Deny yourself daily. One sinner who repents and over 99 so-called righteous persons who need so-called need no repentance. So what is the gospel? It's the power of salvation. Paul says it like this in Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. There's that term again. I highlighted it last week for y'all, by the way. Ponte, there it is, right? Everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then Paul again in Galatians 6, 14. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. When you come to the ministry of the church in the New Testament, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. What does Peter tell the people? They say, what, what do we need to do after you've given us this, the gospel of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And a lot of people close the book at that point. But let's keep reading, right? And you will receive what? The gift of the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you this. Are you alive in the Holy Spirit, or did you close the book on, yeah, I think Jesus died for my sins sometime off there, so that's, I can kind of say that the same way I say I'm going to vote for somebody for president. No, no, no. This is all in with God. Repent, believe, be baptized, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's guaranteed. God's grace in other words, exceeds my expectations and requests by his power, his spirit, at the work that he does in me for his kingdom rewards. And it's beyond what I would ask for. 
Now, I've got to be honest with you. Right now, I'm asking that my mom might be healed. I'm asking for Fancy George to be able to get up, for my mom to be able to get up off of bed, uh, for all kinds of things. I ask for these things. I come to God as a child of his kingdom and ask in the name of Jesus. I do. But I trust in him, and I trust in the big answers that he gives that are beyond what I could ever ask for or imagine. So Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, this is the same Paul who asked for the thorn in his side to be taken away. And God said, no, my grace is made perfect in your weakness. I'm not taking the thorn out of your flesh. This same Paul says in Ephesians 3, 20, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we can ask or think, According to what? The power. That means the Holy Spirit now. The power of God, the presence of God at work within us. And so Jesus says at the close of this little segment on prayer, at the close of verse 13 of Luke 11, how much more the Father who is in heaven will give the Holy Spirit to those asking him. When's the last time you ask to be empowered in God's Holy Spirit today? Okay, through Christ, God calls us to himself as humble yet confident children who, number two, seek his kingdom, receive his spirit, and find and live new life in him. This is the new covenant, the New Testament promise. This is the New Testament promise. So what is the New Covenant? What are we talking about? Why do we call the latter part of this book that we have called the Bible, the New Covenant or the New Testament? It means the same thing, New, New Covenant, New Testament. Well, we get the great prophecy about the New Covenant, certainly back in Deuteronomy as well, um, about the circumcision of the heart. But Jeremiah 31, 31, and I'll give you a little part of 33. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, a new testament, with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. But how? How is this possible? Well, we're helped, among other places and among other voices in the, in the scriptures, by Ezekiel. We just read from Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19, with our call to worship, where the Lord says, I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them the heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. And then listen to Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. Because how am I going to actually walk according to the way of the Lord? You can talk about new covenant all the way, all you want to, but how is it going to be possible in me? In us, here it is. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. There it is, the new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit, there it is, verse 27, I will put my spirit within you and cause you. I'll compel you from the inside out. You'll want to. You will have the power to do it. I will cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So then Paul, amazingly, in Romans, in Romans, he talks about the obedience of the Gentiles even by this transforming work of the Holy Spirit. Romans 15, verse 18, For I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed. How does this work in us? Well, again, Paul in Romans. I'm in Romans a lot here as we close the sermon. Romans 8, 13 through 15. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit, that means the Holy Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now, this is the promise, the promised Spirit. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are, this is an amazing promise, are sons of God. That You can be a girl, you can be a boy. What this is talking about is having a place in the household, being an heir. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received, what did we receive when we believed in Jesus? You received the spirit of adoption as sons who cry, Abba and Father. And again, Romans 8, picking up at verse 26. Likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness. 
for we do not know how to pray as we ought. Ever been in that situation? We do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself from within us. Are you understanding this? Jesus is the right hand of the Father on high, but the Spirit is actually in us and with us, interceding for us. Both, they both intercede, the Spirit within us. We do not know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Let him speak through you. Let him speak in you. And he who searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. I don't know what I need to be praying for my mom right now. May the, may the Spirit guide me in that. Okay, which brings us to number three. So we've talked about the power and centrally the promise. Now the purpose of all this. Through Christ, God calls us to himself as humble yet confident. Humble, be humble. Bow before the Lord and he'll lift you up. But confident children who, number three, knock and enter through Christ. Jesus is the door, his kingdom mission, and eternal house. It turns out it's not about us. It's not all about us. I mean, he will bring us joy and power, but he's calling us into his mission and ultimately to his kingdom, okay? Start looking higher than your immediate concerns. His kingdom mission and eternal house. Belong, pray and obey in predestined sure purpose. Paul says, of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. How is Paul doing all this? By God's power at work in him, and it's on a purpose for a bigger mission. It's not about Paul saying, aren't I great? I have the Holy Spirit in me. What is Paul constantly doing? He's ministering to others. Y'all get this? The power is in him so that he can serve others and glorify God. Romans 8, 16, 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, we know where we belong now. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided, oh man, I really need the Spirit for this, that we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. There's purpose in this power and in this promise of his saving us and filling us with his spirit. Romans 8, 28 and 29. And we know that for those who love God, all things, all things, whether you're bedridden, whether the left side is not working today, whatever is going on with you, whether you're struggling with your work, your marriage, whatever, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Oh, wow. The promise and the gift of the Holy Spirit is a bigger picture thing than I can even imagine right now. Wow. So here's the invitation. Knock and enter through Christ. Jesus is the doorway into the kingdom, into the household of God. His kingdom mission and eternal house. Belong, pray, obey in predestined sure purpose. Man, witness for him. Woman, witness for him. Be transformed by the Holy Spirit. He's not giving you his spirit to give you a little bit of peace on the side and make you think you're really cool. He's giving you his spirit, which is big and has a big mission in this world. And everyone you encounter this week should feel the impact of his presence in you. Will they? Will you be his witnesses? In Starkville, in Mississippi, and to the ends of the earth, we're called to that, and we're called to know that our home is sure in him. So that is the, that's big picture. You could say, Jesus, I don't like big picture. I just kind of wanted a little bit of assurance for today. Well, your assurance for today is part of the big picture. And with Jesus, it's all or nothing. So come into the kingdom. Come into the full gospel of Jesus Christ and know prayers, power, promise, and purpose.
In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.